in the New York Observer, um, I've been following many articles that he's been writing on particular issues in the contemporary art. And today we're going to have Mr. Kramer address one of those issues, and that is the area of criticism in the contemporary art. And now we're going to begin, and thank you all for joining us, and welcome Mr. Kramer. Thank you very much. The um, particular issue that I'm going to be um, addressing today is one that I think uh, embraces the entire art scene of the 1980s. Um, and tries to place what's happened to criticism within it, because I think what's happened to criticism is very much a, um, a reflection of and a coefficient of the peculiar development that the art scene um, has uh, undergone uh, in this most extraordinary of uh, decades uh, in this century in terms of the quantity of art, uh, of new art that's uh, produced and exhibited, um, the sheer numbers of artists, and so on. I think the best way to understand what has happened to the contemporary art scene and its critics in this next to last decade of the 20th century is to see the many ways in which it resembles its historical counterpart in the Paris of the later 19th century. For today we are living with the consequences of what seems to me one of the great reversals of cultural history, a reversal that has made what I would call avant-gardeism, which must be distinguished from the kind of authentic avant-garde uh, which no longer exists, which has made what I call avant-gardeism the contemporary equivalent of 19th century academicism and relegated those artists who remain opposed to the new avant-gardist orthodoxy relegates them to the realm of the outsiders. Most of us, I think, carry a certain picture in our heads of the oppressive and reactionary institutions that made it so difficult for artists of real quality to survive and prosper in 19th century Paris. We've all been brought up on that history of reaction and martyrdom. Simply to name those institutions is to conjure up a world in which Philistinism was the dominant cultural power. The state-sponsored annual or biannual salons whose governing committees were adamant in their resistance to new artistic ideas the academies that were closed to any but the most conventional approaches to art, the press with its timid core of critics that did little more than ratify established reactionary opinion, and the patrons, the collectors, who more often than not were terrified at the thought of embracing or even permitting anything that deviated from accepted taste. From Courbet to Manet to Gauguin and Van Gogh and well into the early careers of even Picasso and Matisse, what we would now call the establishment stood firm, if only for a generation or so, against the acceptance of the greatest art of the period. That art came to be identified with the concept of the avant-garde, 
and it is as monuments and ornaments of an authentic avant-garde culture that the masterworks of modernist art have become enshrined in our museums, in our textbooks, and in the artistic imagination itself. What was once of necessity a vital anti-establishment art has been transformed in the course of time into a tradition. We might even say into the tradition, uh, the tr a tradition that is now seen to stand in a direct line of descent from the masters of the Renaissance and the Baroque and the neoclassic and the romantic epochs in Western art. Toward this tradition, the art world of the 1980s stands in a very curious and ambiguous relation. There is certainly no shortage of adulation and publicity for the masterworks of the past, as we can see in the steady succession of so-called blockbuster exhibitions that are now the favorite enterprise of both our major art museums and of the government and corporate sponsors uh, that finance such events. It would probably be a mistake, however, to assume too quickly from either the frequency or the popularity of these super scale exhibitions that the public derives from them any very clear conception of what great art is. Still less have we any reason to assume that these exhibitions have the effect of enriching the creation of new art. Of course, there are artists among us for whom an encounter with the great art of the past is crucial in providing inspiration and not only aesthetic inspiration. In art, there is also what might be called moral inspiration, and only the greatest art uh, can offer it. 